Liberty is limited by love. That's the important principle that we're talking about on Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard the Bible bus for another great study with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. You know, for the past several days, our theme has been Christian liberty, which we continue today in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. So go ahead and grab your copy of God's Word and find your place, and while you do, I'll share a couple of letters from our fellow Bible bus passengers. First is from a listener in Galveston, Texas. God bless you, brothers. These studies have transformed my heart and mind. They have made me cry and laugh. They comfort me and encourage me. And today, I am a better person and a better Christian because I understand and apply the Word of God in my life. My heroes now reside in the Bible, and I rely on Jesus Christ for my eternal hope. Next, we've got a letter from Maria. She's in California. My husband was a drunk and physically and verbally abused me. It was terrible. I didn't want to live, so I had so much hatred for him. When I was alone and crying, I used to turn on the radio and listen to your program. God used you to wake my sleeping, frustrated, and anxious soul. My soul was fed on these programs, and that's how, after a few months, I gave myself to Jesus Christ. As I learned about God's love for me, I began to change my life. You are and will be the light that brings hope to many other hearts that have been turned off and many that are in darkness. Your teachings have helped thousands of people on the planet who do not know our Savior. I pray and will continue to pray for you and for those who need God's Word. Isn't that a great letter? Thank you, Maria, and praise God for His work in your life. And how's God working in your life through the study of His Word? What have you learned? Why don't you tell us your story? You can do it by emailing us at BibleBus at ttb.org, or you can leave a message on our Facebook page. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word that is a beacon. It's a light in this dark world. So please fill us with your Spirit so that we may have your wisdom and understanding as we spend time in 1 Corinthians. And as we go about our day, may we reflect your light to all who we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, here in the 10th chapter, we did not finish it last time. It's a very important chapter. I'm sure you've noted that. Paul comes back to what he said at the very beginning of this section on Christian liberty. He speaks here of the fact, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now, Paul says, I have freedom to do these questionable things. That is, Paul said, if I felt that I wanted to go to the races, I would go. That is, the races in his day would be the great Olympic events that took place. I think Paul went because he surely uses a great many illustrations that are taken from the athletic events that were carried on in the great coliseums and stadiums of that day. But Paul says it's lawful for me, but it's not always expedient because of the fact that the very thing that I'm doing, it might hurt or harm some other believer, a weaker believer. Paul says things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. That is, they don't build me up in the faith. And a young preacher said to me several years ago about this matter, he said, you think that a preacher ought to go? For instance, he used the term ball games. He knew I didn't go. Well, I said very candidly, my hang-up is not baseball. I used to enjoy playing it, and I've always enjoyed participating in all athletic events, but I've never been very much of a spectator at any of them. I don't care too much about going to watch somebody else play football or play baseball, especially when they're being paid for it. I always played for fun and enjoyed it. But I said to this young man this statement, I said, when I was in school, I read a book that said that anything that a preacher can use in his ministry, in his experience of where he goes, what he sees, and that he ought to confine his life to that because his total life is his ministry. And therefore, as this book said, everything should be grist for his mill. In other words, a minister should take into the pulpit his entire life and not have a hidden part at all, be able to use all of it. And I told him, I said, if you can use the baseball game, 
And you can. I think there are many good illustrations that come from that, and there'd be nothing wrong in that. But it might be that it might not be expedient, that is, influence on somebody else. Now he says, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Means, of course, the other man's welfare. And therefore, a Christian's life should be directed and dictated, not primarily by liberty. We have that liberty. The Christian has a tremendous liberty in Christ, and he's not pinned down by legality. He's not circumscribed by strict rules. Liberty is limited, of course, by love. It's what you want to do to influence and affect others. And that is the thought that Paul has here. You notice in that great second chapter of Philippians, Paul says everything is to be done with others in mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, the basis of this is just simply this, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that is, in the meat market, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so we can enjoy the things of this world. Now, when I say world, I mean creation, the beauties of it, the produce of it, and all of that is something for believers to enjoy. It's the Lord's. He's provided it. Now, he says, when you go into eat, don't ask where the meat came from or that sort of thing. You might say, well, my, this is a very lovely steak that you have today, brother. Where did you get it? My butcher doesn't turn out meat like that to the public. And he might tell you that he went and bought it at the temple. The best thing to do is not to ask him. Now, Paul's using this very practical illustration here. Listen to this, verse 27 now of chapter 10. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. Now, that's the important thing. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols. Eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, the whole point is that if he's eating there, and he's not to ask questions, but if his host volunteers where he got it, and it had been offered to an idol, now Paul says you're not to eat it. Not because there's any rule, there's no rule. Not because you think it's wrong, but you want to help that brother. That's the whole point, my friend. I remember down in Georgia, they have down there a berry they call the scuppignon. It's something like a grape, but it's not a grape. It just grows singly on a vine, and they make wine out of it. A friend of mine told me you went to preach in a certain church, invited out to dinner by one of the officers of the church, and he was handed a glass. He didn't know what it was. He tasted of it. He saw that it was something that had alcohol in it. Now, he's not being super pious because this friend of mine's not that type of individual, but he put it down. And as a minister, why, the man said to him, well, what's the matter with it? Don't you like it? Oh, he said, I think it's delicious. But he said, I noticed that it is a wine, apparently. And he said, I feel that I should not drink it as a Christian. Well, that made a tense moment there for just a moment or two, but he got his point over, and I feel like that he was certainly right. Now, the question would arise, does that minister have as much right to drink that as the elder does? Well, he does. There's no question about that. But he does have a testimony, and that is the thing that I wish that Today, I could get so many Christians that are harsh in their dealings with others because of the legality of it. I don't do this. You shouldn't do it. But their motive is legality. Now, if they can change it to love, it will be an altogether different approach. And that's the reason and should be the motive for a Christian not doing certain things. 
Now he says here, Conscience, I say, not thine own, but the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Now, why should I be restricted by some of these weak brethren? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Now, the thing is, Paul says that it's unfair to judge me because of another man's conscience. But whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now, my friend, this is not a rule, but it's a great principle. Paul has stated certain great principles here that relate to Christian liberty. One of those principles is all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now, here's another one. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And my friend, that is the test of every believer. Can I do this or can I not? Should I do this or should I not? Can you do it for the glory of God? And I'm of the opinion there's some people that don't even go to church for the glory of God. And if you're not going for the glory of God, then I'd say stay home. That'd be the best thing to do. And I'm sure the attitude and action of certain people, of the saints, their criticism, their gossip, their harshness, their bitterness that's in their hearts, going to church, my friend, actually becomes a sin. Because what a believer does, he should do it for the glory of God. That's the important thing. In fact, that's the all-important thing. Now, he says here, give none offense. None. And he divides the human family into three groups. And I think we have those three groups today. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Now, we should not offend folk who have certain beliefs relative to diet, for instance. I think that it would be wrong to invite an Orthodox Jewish friend to your home and serve him a well, a ham. I think that that would just be the wrong thing to do. We're to give none offense in these matters, nor are the Gentiles. Now, there are a lot of Gentiles with some very peculiar notions today. Now, I don't propose myself to attempt to please all of these. In fact, there are a lot of, may I say, radical and way out yonder thinking today. But we ought not to offend them, nor to the church of God. Now, some young people that are the hippie type, they came to me and they said to me some time ago, we went to a certain church and we were rebuked because of our dress. Don't you think that they were wrong? Well, there are two things. I think both groups are wrong. And I told these young people, I said, they were wrong in criticizing you. They shouldn't have done it especially verbally before others. I think they were wrong in that. But also, I think you were wrong to go like you were. You were Christians. You had your Bible. You were offending them. And we are told today we're not to offend in these matters, neither the Jews nor the Gentiles nor the church of God. Those are the three great divisions of the human family today. And one of these days, the church of God is going to leave this earth. Then you're going to have Jews and Gentiles in the world. And then God has a tremendous program that will take place at that time. Now, Paul says here, "...even as I please all men and all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved." Now, primarily, what we do, we're to do for the glory of God. Whatsoever we do, whether it be to eat or drink or anything, do it to the glory of God. And I think a Christian can, well, I think a housewife can wash the dishes, sweep the floor. A man can dig a ditch. He can mow the lawn. Whatever you do, you can do it to the glory of God. I don't care what it is. Well, if you can't do it to the glory of God, you ought not to be doing it. And we ought to remember that all of this is that there might be those that 
are lost that might be saved. And it's more important, friends, to make tracks in the world than to give out tracks. This is what a very wise man said to a person who was very zealous in giving out tracks in Memphis, Tennessee. This man was coming down the street handing out tracks to everybody, and he handed one to this man, and he said to him, What is that? He says, It's a track. Oh, he said, I can't read it. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do, though. I'll watch your tracks. And believe me, friends, that's much more impressive. And you can read those lots better than you can read the tracks you hand out. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you're not to hand out tracks. But I am saying that it's very important to make the right kind of tracks. Now, we come to chapter 11, and actually this first verse belongs back, I think, to the uh, other chapter. It says, Be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ. And that is something that I dare say that very few of us, well, I ought not to sit in judgment on you, that's for sure, but that's something that I dare not say. I want you to be a follower of Paul and a follower of the Lord Jesus. And not to look to me, but isn't that a tremendous statement? Now we come to hear another division, and this is concerning woman's dress, by the way, of all things. And this is something else that they had asked about, you see. Now, will you notice, Paul says, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Paul says, I praise you. Up to this point, he says, I praise you not. But now, he says, I praise you because you remember me in all things. They remembered Paul in their prayers and in their giving. Now, Paul again puts down a great principle. He says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And I know that there are those today that like to emphasize that middle statement, the head of the woman is the man. But you put them all together, and when you put them all together, you're not going to come up with the viewpoint that some have. Now, Paul puts down this great principle. This is authority for the sake of order, to eliminate confusion. The pastor who was having trouble in his church said to me several years ago, I asked him what the problem was. He says, I've got too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Everybody wants to be a leader. And we have today leadership training in the church. I'd like to know where you find that in the Bible. We have certain organizations, they say they exist to Train young people to be leaders, to speak. Paul says, study to be quiet. And I wish today that we could put the emphasis where the Bible puts it and get rid of this leadership training today. We don't need all of the leadership training. We need folk that will act and live like Christians. That's the important thing. Now, the important word here is head, if you'll notice. I know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, the head of Christ is God. The head is the one that gives the directions. Now, here actually is where I think I disagree with my instructors. They say here, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, the head of Christ is God. And they speak here of the Christian man. Well, the normal order here, and the correct order, is for Christ to be head of every man. This doesn't mean just to be a Christian man. Until a man is mastered by Christ, he's not a man. He's not normal Christian man. Now, there are those today that are mastered by drink. There are those today mastered by passion, those mastered by the flesh. But we need to be mastered by Christ. Augustine says our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, until we come and make him the head. 
And there's men that have done that. Martin Luther came to that place, and Wilberforce did, and Wilberforce had been a profligate. Augustine had been the same thing, Martin Luther, an Augustinian monk. May I say to you that these men were mastered by Christ. And I hear today, he's a Christian man. Is he mastered by Christ? That's the important thing. That's what he's saying here. Now, the head of the woman is the man. There's no article with man. And it's not every woman. It's not an absolute. In marriage, woman is to respond to the man. That's the general principle. And it's normal, I think, for a woman to be subject to the man in marriage. A woman who cannot look up to a man and respect him, she ought not to follow him, and surely she ought not to marry him. That's the important thing. But a real woman responds with every fiber of her being to the man that she loves. But he must be the man that's willing to die for her. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Dr. Jekyll Morgan tells about that he and his wife had a friend, very brilliant woman. She had a very strong personality. She was outstanding, and she was not married. And he asked her one day the very pointed question, says, why have you never married? And she said, I've never found a man who can master me. And she never married. Well, until a woman finds that man, she'll make a mistake marrying Mr. Milktoe. She'll be in trouble from that day on. Now the head of Christ is God. This is tremendous. I and the Father are one, the Lord Jesus said. But he also said, my Father is greater than I. Now there's a great mystery here. In the work of redemption, he took a lower place voluntarily made lower than the angels. He walked a lowly path way down here. We're told to let that same mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And this is a section that has special application, I think, to Corinth. Your local situation, I think, could be different. Your church and community may be different than it was in Corinth. But in Corinth, This was the thing that was all important in that day, and I still believe it's a great principle for today, by the way. Now, in verse 4, he says, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, he dishonoreth his head. Now, the rabbi in that day taught that a man was to cover his head. And Paul says that they actually misinterpreted Moses, they missed the whole point, because over in 2 Corinthians 3, 13, it says, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. The thing was that that glory in Moses' face was beginning to disappear after he came down from the mount. He covered his face so they wouldn't discover that, by the way. And that is the thing now that Paul is saying that you ought not to cover your head. A man created in the image of God, who is in Christ by redemption, is to have his head uncovered as a symbol of dignity and liberty. That is the thought that is here. And he's praying and prophesying. He's speaking for a man to God prophesying, speaking for God to man. And standing in these two holy, sacred positions, he's to have his head uncovered. And you know, we didn't get down to woman's dress quite, but we're right by it now. We'll sure be there next time. That was a great study. If you'd like to continue your study of God's Word this weekend, I hope that you'll join us for the Sunday Sermon. Dr. McGee's topic this week is the reality of the resurrection. To listen online or through one of our apps, or see if your radio station carries the Sunday Sermon, visit us at ttb.org. If you want to know about some resources to deepen your personal study of God's Word, let us help. Just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And when you call us, please be sure to mention the name of the station or how you listened to Through the Bible. Remember, this little bit of information helps us. So thanks in advance. 
You know, there are many more great truths to learn from Paul in 1 Corinthians. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to join us on Monday as we continue our exciting journey through the Bible. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.